for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping our times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. <laughs> Call in the messenger sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our oar, or break it all to pieces. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. Your Highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the Prince our Master says that you savour too much of your youth and bids you be advised. There's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you, metre for your spirit, this ton of treasure. And in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. <laughs> and tell the pleasant prince... This mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn, that shall have cause to curse the dauphin scorn. Convey them with safe conduct. Fare you well. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armourers, and honour's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defences. Therefore the Dukes of Berry and of Bretagne, of Brabant and of Orleans shall make forth. And you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch, to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defend. For England, his approaches makes us fierce as waters to the sucking of a gulf. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe. And let us do it with no show of fear. No, with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Whitson Morris dance. For my good liege, she is so idly king. Her sceptre so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fear attends her not. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question your grace the late ambassadors, with what great state he heard their embassy, how well supplied with noble counsellors, how modest an exception, and with all how terrible in constant resolution. Well, tis not so, my lord high constable, but though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defence, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. So the proportions of defence are filled, which of a weak and niggardly projection doth like a miser spoil his coat with scanting a little cloth. Think we, King Harry, strong. And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us. And he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame 
when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captive by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, to crave admittance to your majesty. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. You see, this chase is hotly followed, friends. Turn head and stop pursuit. For coward dogs most spend their mouths when what they seem to threaten runs far before them. Good, my sovereign, take up the English short and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother of England? From him. And thus he greets your majesty. He wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, longs to him and to his heirs. Namely, the crown and all wide stretched honours that pertain by custom and the ordinance of times unto the crown of France. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel. This is his claim, his threatening and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to? I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Say, if my father render fair return, it is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. A night is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Thus, with imagined wing, our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty, and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies. And in them behold, upon the hempen tackle, ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threatened sails, born with invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottom through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage, and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical holding due course to Harfleur. Follow, follow. Once more unto the breach, dear friends. Once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace. There's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favoured rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock or hang and jutty his confounded base, swelled with a wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up. Up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war-proof fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheath their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copying out a men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry! Harry! England! England! And St. George! You must come presently to the mines. The Duke of Gloucester would speak with you. To the mines. 
tell you the duke, it is not so good to come to the mines. For look you, the mines is not according to the disciplines of the war. The concavities of it is not sufficient. For look you, the adversary you may discuss under the duke of you is digged himself four yard under the countermine. By Jesus, I think it will blow a ball if there's not better direction. The Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by an Irishman. A very valiant gentleman, if faith. Captain McMorris, is it not? I think it is. Oh, by jeez, you, he is an ass as in the world. I will verify as much in his beard. Here he comes. And the Scots captain, Captain Jamie, with him. I say good day, Captain Cruella. Gotten to your worship, good Captain James. How now, Captain McMorris? Have you quit the mines? Have the pioneers given all? Be Christ, lot is ill done. The work is given over. The trumpets sound the retreat. By my heart, I swear, and my father saw it, the work is ill done. It is given over. I would have blowed up the town, so Christ save me lot in an hour. Oh, it is ill done, it is ill done. By my hand, it is ill done. Captain McMorris. I beseech you now, will you vouchsafe me, look you, a few disputations with you, as partly touching or concerning the disciplines, the war, the Roman wars, and the way of argument, look you, and friendly communications. Right? Part, partly, partly to satisfy my opinion, and partly for the satisfaction, look you, of my mind. No, as I... touching, as touching the direction of the military discipline, that is the point. It will be very good, good faith, good captains, both. As no time to this course, a Christ save the town is besieged, and the Trumpet calls us to the gate, but we talk and be Christ do nothing. Tis shame for us all. So God save it, tis shame to stand still. The town sounds appalling. Captain McMorris, when there is more better opportunity to be required, look you, I will be as bold as to tell you I know the discipline's the war, and there is an end. How yet resolves the governor of the town? If I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved half-fleur till in her ashes she lie buried. What say you? Will you yield in this avoid, or guilty in defence be thus destroyed? Our expectation hath this day an end. The dauphin, whom of succours we entreated, returns us that his powers are yet not ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates. Come, Uncle Exeter. Go you and enter Harfleur. There remain and fortified strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear Uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in Harfleur will we be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed. In Rouen, the French king's daughter tries to learn English from her maid, Alice. Alice, tu as été en Angleterre et tu parles bien le langage. Un peu, madame. Je te prie, monseigneur, il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment appelez-vous la main en anglais La main, elle est appelée the hand. The hand. Et les doigts Les doigts Ma foi, j'oublie les doigts. Mais je me souviendrai. Les doigts, je pense qu'ils sont appelés the fingers. Oui, the fingers. La main, the hand. Les doigts, the fingers. Je pense que je suis le bon écolier. J'ai gagné deux mots d'anglais vitement. Comment appelez-vous les angles Les angles, nous les appelons dinels. Dinels. Écoutez, dites-moi si je parle bien. Dinels. Dinels. Et dinels. C'est bien dit, madame. Il est fort bon anglais. Dites-moi l'anglais pour le bras. Dis arme, madame. Et le coude Delbo. Delbo. Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris dès à présent. Il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, lis ce côté. Ti hint, ti fingres, ti nils, ti arna, ti bilbo. Ti elbo, madame. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. Ti elbo. Comment appelez-vous le col Ti nick, madame. Ti nick. Et le menton Ti chine. Le col, le manteau, le signe. 
Oui, en vérité, vous prononcez les mots aussi droit que les natifs d'Angleterre. Je ne doute point d'apprendre par la grâce de Dieu et en peu de temps. N'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vous ai enseigné Non, je reste mon Nails, the nails, madame. The nails, the arm, the elbow. Sauf votre honneur, the elbow. Ainsi dis-je, the elbow. The nick et the si. Comment appelez-vous le pied et la robe? Le foot et le caoun. Le foot et le caoun. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, ce sont mots de son mauvais, corruptibles, gros et impudiques, et non pour les dames d'honneur d'usé. Je ne voudrais prononcer ces mots devant les seigneurs de France pour tout le monde. Faut, faut le camp. Néanmoins, je réciterai une autre fois ma leçon ensemble. Die Hink, die Fingers, die Nets, die Arme, die Elbow, <rire> die die Sine, die Foot, le camp. Excellent, madame. Ça, c'est pour une fois. Allons-nous à dîner. <laughs> Meanwhile, King Henry continues his advance into France. Now, now, Captain Flewellen, come you from the bridge? I assure you, Captain Gower, there is very excellent service committed at the bridge. There is an ancient lieutenant there at the bridge. I think in my very conscience he is as valiant a man as Mark Antony. And he is a man of no estimation in the world, but I did see him do as gallant service. What do you call him? He is called Ancient Pistol. I know him not. Captain! Ah! Captain! There he is! Ah, Captain, I beseech thee to do me favours. Bardolph, a soldier firm and sound of heart and of buxom valour. Hath by cruel fate and giddy fortune's furious ah. fickle wheel that God is blind that stands upon the rolling restless stone. Ah. Uh, by your patience, ancient pistol, mm. uh, uh, fortune, fortune is painted blind with a muffler for her eyes to signify to you that that fortune is blind, uh -huh. and, and and she is also painted with a wheel to signify to you which is the moral of it that she is turning and inconstant and mutability and variation and, and her foot look you is fixed upon a spherical stone which rolls and rolls and rolls ah. in good truth the poet makes a most excellent description of it fortune is an excellent moral fortune is bad also and frowns on him for he has stolen a pax and mm. hanged must be oh a damned death let gallows cape for dark let men go free speak captain for his life, and I will thee requite. Ancient Pistol, I do uh, partly understand your meaning. Why then? Rejoice, therefore. Certainly, Ancient, it is not a thing to rejoice at. For if, look you, he were my brother, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put him to execution, ah. for discipline ought to be used. Die, and be damned, and Figo, <laughs> for thy friendship. It is well. The fig of Spain. Very good. Why, this is an arrant counterfeit rascal. I remember him now, a board, a cut purse. I'll assure you are uttered as brave words at the bridge as you shall see in a summer's day. But it is very well. What he spoke to me, that is well, I warrant you, when time shall serve. Huh. The French king sends his herald Montjoy to King Henry. Thus says my king, Say thou to Harry of England, Though we seem dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at Harfleur, But that we thought not good to bruise an injury Till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, See his weakness and admire our sufferance. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. For to say the sooth, though it is no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage, my people are with sickness much enfeebled, my number lessened, and those few I have almost know better than so many French. 
Go. Bid thy master well advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolour. And so, Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. I shall deliver, sir. Thanks to your majesty. Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army still sounds that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful neighs, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armourers accomplishing the nights with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor, condemned English, like sacrifices by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger. And their gesture sad, investing lanklean cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now who will, behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry, praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face, there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of colour unto the weary and all-watched night, but freshly looks, and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks. A largess universal, like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to every one thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all behold as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. Kimala! A friend. Uh, discuss unto me, art thou officer, or art thou base, common and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. Ah. Trillst thou the puissant pike? Even so, what are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are better than the king. The king's a boarcock and a heart of gold, a lad of life, an imp of fame, of parents good, a fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe, and from a heartstring I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry Leroy. Leroy? Mm, a Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? No, I am a Welshman. Knowest thou of Llewellyn? Yes. Tell him I'll knock his leek about his pate upon St. David's day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. Art thou his friend? And his kinsman, too. The pie goat for thee, then. I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Call. It sorts well with your fierceness. Ah! Brother John Bates. Is not that the morning which breaks yonder? I think it be. But we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under uh, Sir Thomas Irvingham. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that look to be washed off the next time. He hath not told his thought to the king. No, nor it is not meet he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man, 
as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me, the element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies laid by in his nakedness, he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with a like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason or fears as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason, no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. So I would he were, and I'd buy him at all adventures, so we were quit here. By my truth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Farewell. Upon the king. Let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool whose sense no more can feel but his own bringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect? that private men enjoy. And what have kings that privates have not to save? Ceremony. Save general ceremony. My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through the camp to find you. Good old knight, collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. O oh, god of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning if the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. My liege! My brother Gloucester's voice. Aye, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. King himself is rode to do their battle. The fighting men, they have full three score thousand. It's five to one. Besides, they all are fresh. God's arm strike with us. Tis a fearful odds. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honour, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cuz, wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honour as one man more, methinks, would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. Oh. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. True. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say, Tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then would he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin, Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we, in it, shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks... That fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day! My sovereign lord, my sovereign lord, be 
bestir yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedients charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Let us not wish more help from England, Gus. God's will, my liege, would you and I alone without more help could fight this royal battle. Why now thou hast unwished 5,000 men which likes me better than to wish as one? You know your places. God be with you all. Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. Good God! Why should they mock poor fellows thus? The man that once did sell the lion's skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him. And many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves, upon the which I trust shall witness live in brass of this day's work. And those that leave their valiant bones in France, dying like men, though buried in your dunghills, they shall be famed, for there the sun shall greet them and draw their honours, reeking up to heaven, leaving their earthly paths to choke your climb. The smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. There's not a piece of feather in our host. Good argument. I hope we will not fly. And time hath worn us into slovenry. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. And my poor soldiers tell me, yet ere night they'll be in fresher robes. Or they will pluck the gay new coats or the French soldiers' heads and turn them out of service. If they do this, as if God please they shall, my ransom then will soon be levied. Herald. Save thou thy labour. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none, I swear, but these my joints, which if they have as I will leave in them, shall yield them little, tell the constable. I shall, King Harry, and so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear herald any more. I fear thou wilt once more come again for ransom. Now, soldiers, march away. And how thou pleasest, God, dispose the day. Constable of France, the Dukes of Orleans and Bourbon, and the Dauphin realize that they have lost the day. Oh, Diable! Not de ma vie. All is confounded, all reproach and everlasting shame sits mocking in our plumes. Oh, Meshant, thought you do not run away. Why? All our ranks are broke! Oh, perdurable shame! Let's stab ourselves. Be these the wretches that we played a dice for. Is this the king we sent to for his ransom? Shame and eternal shame, nothing but shame. Let us die in honor. Once more back again. And he that will not follow Bourbon now, let him go hence. And with his cap in hand, like a base panda, hold the chamber door, whilst by a slave, no gentler than my dog, his fairest daughter is contaminated. Disorder that hath spoiled us, friend us now. Let us on heaps go offer up our lives. We are in now yet living in the field to smother up the English in our throngs. If any order might be thought of. The devil take order now. Out of the throng. Let life be short. Else shame will be too long. But King Henry is not yet certain of victory. Well have we done, thrice valiant countrymen. But all's not done. Yet keep the French the field. The Duke of York commends him to your majesty. Lives he, good uncle. Thrice within this hour I saw him down. Thrice up again and fighting. From helmet to the spur all blood he was. In which array, brave soldier, doth he lie. Larding the plain. And by his bloody side, yoke fellow to his honour owing wounds, the noble Earl of Suffolk also lies. 
Suffolk first died, and York, all haggled over, comes to him, where in gore he lay in steeped, and takes him by the beard, kisses the gashes that bloodily did yawn upon his face, and cries aloud, Tarry, my cousin Suffolk, my soul shall thine keep company to heaven. Tarry, sweet soul for mine, then fly abreast, as in this glorious and well-foughten field we kept together in our chivalry. A testament of noble ending love. The pretty and sweet manner of it forced those waters from me, which I would have stopped. But I had not so much of man in me, and all my mother came into mine eyes and gave me up to tears. I blame you not. For hearing this, I must perforce compound with mistful eyes, or they will issue too. Oh! But hark, what new alarm is the same? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Kill the boys and the luggage? Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis as ardent a piece of knavery, Mark, you know, as can be offered in your conscience, now is it not? Tis certain there's not a boy left alive, and the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle have done this slaughter. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. Take a trumpet, Herald. Ride thou unto the horsemen in yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down, or avoid the field they do offend our sight. If they do neither... We will come to them and make them scare away as swift as stones in force it from the old Assyrian slings. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have, and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. His eyes are humbler than they used to be. How now? What means this herald? Knowst thou not that I have fined these bones of mine for ransom? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men, for many of our princes woe the while lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood, so do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes, and their wounded steeds fret fetlock deep in gore and with wild rage yerk out their armed heels at their dead masters, killing them twice. Oh, give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Herald, I know not if the day be ours or no, for yet are many of your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field. The day is yours. Praised be God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this the field of Agincourt, Fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. Now, Herald, are the dead numbered? Here is the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of ten thousand French that in the field lie slain. Where is the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York. The Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire. None else of name, and of all other men but five and twenty. O oh God, thy arm was here, and not to us but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. When, without stratagem, but in plain shock and even play of battle, was ever known so great and little loss on one part and the other? Take it, God, for it is none but thine. It is wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be it death proclaim it through our host to boast of this, or take that praise from God, which is his only. Is it not lawful and please your majesty to tell how many is killed? Yes, Captain. But with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites? Let them be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais, and to England then, when ne'er from France arrived, more happy men. But now behold, in the quick forge and working house of thought, how London doth pour out her citizens. The mayor and all his brethren in best sort, like to the senators of the antique Rome with the plebeians swarming at their heels, 
Go forth and fetch their conquering Caesar in. Now in London place him. As yet the lamentation of the French invites the King of England stay at home. The Emperor's coming in behalf of France to order peace between them. And amidst all the occurrences, whatever chanced, till Harry's back return again to France. There must we bring him. And myself have played the interim by remembering you, tis past. Then brook abridgment, and your eyes advance after your thoughts, straight back again to France. Why wear you your leek today? St. David's day is past. There is occasions and causes, why and wherefore, in all things. I will tell you, as my friend, Captain Gower, the rascally, scald, beggarly, lousy, plugging knave pistol, which you and yourself and all the world know to be no better than a fellow, look you, of no merits, he has come to me and brings me bread and salt yesterday, look you, and bid me eat my leek. It was in a place where I could not breed no contention with him. But I will be so bold as to wear it in my cap till I see him once again, and then I will tell him a little piece of my desires. Why, here he comes, swelling like a turkey cock. It is no matter for his swellings nor his turkey cocks. God bless you, ancient pistol, you scurvy, lousy knave. God bless you. Hence, I am qualmish with the smell of leek. I beseech you heartily, scurvy, lousy knave, at my desires and my requests and my petitions to eat, look you, this leek. <laughs> because, look you, you do not love it, nor your affections and your appetites and your digestions does not agree with it, I would desire you to eat it. <laughs> not for Cadwallader and all his goats. There is one goat for you. No! Oh. Will you be so good, scald knave, as eat it? Haste, Trojan! Thou shalt die! No. You say very true, scald knave, when God's will is. I will desire you to live in the meantime and eat your victuals. Come, there is sauce for it. No. I pray you fall too. If you can muck a leek, you can eat a leek. No. Enough, Captain, you have astonished him. I will say I will make him eat some part of my leek, or I will beat his pate for days. No, no, no. But I pray you, it is good for your green wound and your bloody coxcomb. Must I mind? Yes, certainly, and out of doubt and out of question to an ambiguity. Is... <sighs> my this leek, I will most horribly revenge. Oh, 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 I eat, and eat, I swear. Eat, I pray you, will you have some more sauce to your oh, leek? No, oh, oh, there is not enough leek to swear by. Oh, quiet, I can't you. I'll just see you, I eat. Oh, much good to you, scald knave heartily. Nay, pray you, throw none away. Oh, the skin is good for your broken coxcomb. When you take occasions to see leeks hereafter, I pray you mock at them, that is all. Yeah, good. Aye, leek is good. God be with you and keep you and heal your pate. All hell shall stir for this. Go, go, you are a counterfeit, cowardly knave. You thought because he could not speak English in the native garb, he could not therefore handle an English cudgel. You find it otherwise, and henceforth let a Welsh correction teach you a good English condition. Fare ye well. <clears throat> A peace conference is held between the two kings. King Henry is accompanied by the Duke of Exeter and other lords, the King of France by Queen Isabel, their daughter Catherine, the Duke of Burgundy and others. Peace to this meeting wherefore we are met, and to our brother France and to our sister health and fair time of day. Joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin Catherine. And as a branch and member of this royalty by whom this great assembly is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy. And princes, French and peers, health to you all. Right joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. So are you, princes English, every one. My duty to you both on equal love, great kings of France and England. That I have laboured with all my wits, my pains, and strong endeavours to bring your most imperial majesties unto this bar and royal interview, your mightiness on both parts best can witness. Since then my office hath so far prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye you have congreeted. Let it not disgrace me, if I demand before this royal view what rub or what impediment there is, why that the naked, poor and mangled peace, dearness of arts, plenties and joyful births, 
should not in this best garden of the world our fertile France put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace whose want gives growth to the imperfections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands, whose tenures and particular effects you have and scheduled briefly in your hands. The king hath heard them. To the which as yet there is no answer made. Well, then, the peace which you before so urged lies in his answer. I have but with a cursory eye, or glance, the articles. Pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us once more, with better heed to resurvey them. We will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Go, Uncle Exeter and Brother Clarence, and you, Brother Gloucester, Warwick, and Hunton, can go with the king, and take with you free power to ratify, augment, or alter, as your wisdom's best shall see advantageable for our dignity, anything in or out of our demands, and we'll consign thereto. Will you, fair sister, go with the princes, or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Haply a woman's voice may do some good, when articles too nicely urged be stood on. Yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our capital demand, comprised within the full rank of our articles. She hath good leave. Um, fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. I speak to thee, plain soldier. If thou canst love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true, but for thy love by the Lord, no, yet I love thee too. And while thou livest, dear Kate, take a fellow of plain and uncoined constancy, for he perforce must do thee right, because he hath not the gift to woo in other places. A good heart, Kate, is the sun and the moon, or rather the sun and not the moon, for it shines bright and never changes, but keeps his course truly. If thou would have such a one, take me, and take me, take a soldier, take a soldier, take a king. And what sayest thou? Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, it is not possible that you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with the village of it. I will have it all mine. And, Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. No, Kate. Then I will tell thee in French. Je... Quand sous la possession de France et quand vous avez la possession de moi. Let me see what then. Saint Denis be my speed. Dans votre et France et vous êtes mienne. That is as it shall please the war, mon père. Nay, it will please him well, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that I kiss your hand and I call you my queen. Laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez ma foi. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Les dames et demoiselles peuvent être baisées devant leurs noces. Il n'est pas la coutume de France. Madame, my interpreter, what says she? That it is not be the fashion for the ladies of France. I cannot tell what is baiser in English. To kiss. Your Majesty entendre better que moi. It is not a fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married, would she say? Oui, vraiment. Nice customs curtsy to great kings. Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners. Kate, you have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. There is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. Here comes your father. We have consented to all terms of reason. Is so, my lords of England? The king hath granted every article, his daughter first, and then in sequel all according to their firm proposed natures. Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me that the contending kingdoms of France and England, 
whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred. And this dear conjunction plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms. That never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Amen. Amen. Now welcome, Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day, my Lord of Burgundy, we'll take your oath and all the peers for surety of our league. Then shall I swear to Kate and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story. In little room, confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived, this star of England.